You're listening to the Straits of Video Podcast with Rob Lane. Hello, how is everything going? Hope you all had a great Halloween and welcome along to a brand new episode of the Straight to Video Podcast. On today's show, I had a lot of fun chatting with actor, producer and musician Thomas Nicholas. Many of you will know Thomas from his role of Kevin Myers in the iconic American Pie series of movies. Perhaps you saw him in his breakout role in Rookie of the Year. Or maybe you know him from seeing him perform in the Thomas Nicholas Band who have been recording and performing for 15 years throughout the US. And he's a regular visitor to venues throughout the UK too. In fact, he'll be back over here in just a few weeks. Right now, Thomas is as busy as ever writing and recording his brand new album with lit drummer Taylor Carroll at the production desk. He's just dropped a brilliant new single, Tomorrow's Gonna Hurt. And not only that, he's not slacking on the acting and producing scene as his new TV series, Underdeveloped, is out in the US and will hopefully be hitting the UK as well soon. We chat about all of this in today's episode as well as deep diving into his journey through Hollywood and many of the important introductions to music along the way. This Straight to Video podcast is proudly presented to you in association with Affinity Photo, an incredible piece of photo editing software which I've been using for graphic design the past couple of years. It's used to create the podcast episode art where you see each week, and it's an extremely affordable alternative to other programs on the market. Plus, stay tuned as we might have some really cool giveaways from Affinity on this show, so please check them out at affinity.serif.com. There's lots to cover in this week's chat with Thomas Nicholas, so let's dive in. Afterwards, if you want to find out more, then head on over to tinicholas.com or reach out on social media to keep up to date, find tour dates, and hear the awesome new single Tomorrow's Gonna Hurt. But right now, please enjoy my straight-to-video chat with Thomas Nicholas. <laughs> Everything's broken. Oh, mate. It's Friday. Who cares? Who cares? Yeah. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Oh, wait. I think I fixed it. There it is. Okay. Sweet. How are you, man? Good to see you. I'm good, man. Thanks for taking the time today to to chat. Oh, likewise. Likewise. I appreciate it. I'm looking at myself in my screen right now, and I realize it looks like a bit out of a scene out of Wayne's World, you know, when they, like, sell out. Like, I'm just, like, (laughs) logos everywhere. Like, I think it's sad, you know, when people just, like, sell out. And he's like... (laughs) Little yellow new print. <laughs> Amazing. Was you a fan of the Wayne's World films? Were they big for you? You know, they were because I think for me, I had grown up listening to my mom's collection of music. And as a gift, when I did a I did a baseball film in 92 called Rookie of the Year, obviously folks in the UK and other like in Europe, not really big into the American baseball films. So, you know, maybe a little lesser known, but it was a big deal over here and maybe in Japan. I'm big in Japan. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> And so they gave us a gift. They gave us a Walkman. And I still have this Walkman. And they gave me a copy of Wayne's World soundtrack. And that's when I fell in love with Queen. Oh, nice. I remember like being in school after that. And we were in music class. This is like three months later. And they were like, write down your favorite artist. And I wrote Queen. And no one in seventh grade knew who that was. They just laughed that I had written the name Queen. And I was like, you guys are idiots. I don't know what to tell you. That soundtrack was quite a good like educational one because they had bands covering older songs. You had Bullet Boys doing Rock Candy, like the old Montrose song. Obviously, Ballroom Blitz. Dude, I mean, it was a great soundtrack because of that movie. So I started playing guitar like two years after that. So the first song I learned was my mom had a songbook by Bread. So I learned how to play If which is like all open chords, right? Just finger picking. But then because of Wayne's World, the next song I learned was Stairway to Heaven. All of it or just the intro? <laughs> all of it, the whole thing. Wow. I bought like a tablature book on Led Zeppelin. I was a huge fan because that's what I grew up listening to was Led Zeppelin. I wore out my mom's Houses of the Holy tape. She was so pissed off at me when I was like 11 years old. She's like, you've ruined my tape. But yeah, so I used to say for years that the first song I learned how to play was Stairway to Heaven because I was like, I can't admit to bread. And then I found out Radiohead was heavily influenced by bread. I was like, I can talk about bread. Zero guilty pleasures. Zero guilty pleasures. Whatever you like, you like. Just roll with it. (laughs) Well, we just dive straight in. Yeah. It's great. I just figure it's all fair game. If I'm here with you, anything I say is admissible in a court of law. We're good. (laughs) 
<laughs> I probably should have brought a cup of coffee with me, but I'll survive. You are a big coffee drinker, right? Oh, dude, you have no idea. Nine double shot Americanos a day, baby. Wow. I drink a lot, but I don't think I drink that much. <laughs> That's because like the last two nights I've been working in the studio with Taylor on the record till like five and then getting up with my kids at like seven. My kid's mom is like, you're an idiot. You need to sleep. I'm like, no, I just need more coffee. Everything's fine. Mate, I love it. Well, I'm coming to you from near Nottingham in the UK, where I know you're going to be pretty soon. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I jumped on a show with The Bottom Line because I saw my friends Lacey were playing and I was planning on being there for Wales Comic Con. I was like, can I come and open up this show? And since then, it's not announced yet, but I think I'm trying to work it out with Tom from The Bottom Line to finally play the Teddy Rocks Festival in May. Oh, sweet. Yeah. It's all happening. You are like super busy. It's like constantly, nonstop. And that's why I don't have time to sleep, you know? Behind you, you've got both things you're representing the music music and the film industry and stuff. Is it hard to juggle all this stuff or and all these different avenues? Or are you someone who's always like wearing different hats and staying busy? Ironically, wearing another hat representing another company. <laughs> I know. Yeah, basically the key is coffee and lack of sleep, which again, everyone thinks I'm crazy. But you know, I feel like you can bank sleep. Okay. Every once in a while, it catches up with me and then I'll sleep 12 hours. And I feel like that buys me like three days of no sleep. It's like putting money in the sleep bank, putting sleep in the, I can't even talk. Maybe I should get some sleep. Maybe like four hours is my normal. Two is a little excessive. Wow. Yeah. Two is like close your eyes and open them again. And it's, you feel like crap. All your body starts shaking when you're in that kind of mode. Yeah. Well, yesterday was a big day in the studio and I don't know that I can talk about any of it yet because we're still waiting for permission from the one feature of someone who just popped in to say hi. Yes. And then Taylor was like, hey, check out this chorus I wrote last night because he had also stayed up till five in the morning. Taylor and I are bad news for each other. We basically just work all the time. So he played the chorus and then 30 seconds later, our friend was writing a verse, a melody, and then three hours later, he's like, I was only stopping in for five minutes. <laughs> like, yeah, but can you just like jump in the booth and record a vocal on that really quick before you go? How great is that though? I was just speaking to a friend of mine about this the other day. Today, everyone has their own little studio where they can mail stuff in or get people from everywhere to mail stuff in. But I think it's so great to be in a studio environment working alongside somebody and you have stuff like that. You can have people come in. So you will always have, however this works out, whatever happened last night or yesterday, you will have memories of that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really cool attachment. I agree with you because so one of my good friends is from Warrington and he lives in Nashville now. His name is Johnny Lucas and he produced my nine. I call them the lockdown singles. They were basically the singles that kept me, you know, mentally healthy during that time period. And I was just going to put those as my seventh album. But Ace Enders from the early November heard the last single and he goes, hey, man, I like where you're going with your music. And we've been friends for a few years. We met in Nottingham, actually hit the deck in 2015. And so he's like, I like where you're going. Let's go right together. So after the lockdown period, I went to Ace Enders studio in Ocean City, New Jersey. And that was my first like in-person writing session after like two years of writing virtually. And as soon as we wrote the song, I go, I love those songs, but they already came out. Now this is going to go on the seventh album. And I started the idea of collaborating with my friends. And now here we are. And now I can't even tell you new friends I'm making that I'm <laughs> collaborating with, but it's a pretty big deal. As long as he says yes to the feature. I mean, we still wrote the song together. So the name's on there regardless. Yes, his name is on there. It's whether or not I can say featuring his band. Okay, fair enough. You have been mentioning the name Taylor, though, and we're talking about Taylor Carroll, the drummer of Lit, who is producing and working with you. How did that all come together? Yeah, we. I'm trying to think how we first started talking. I think it was a couple years ago, and... I've been friends with Kevin Baldi's the bass player from Lit. Legend. Absolute legend. Yeah, I love that dude. We met at NAM like one year and I was like, you're in Lit. And I invited him to my band show at the Viper Room and he showed up. That doesn't happen. Like people no. in LA are like, yeah, man, I'll come to your show. No problem. <laughs> and then you never see them again in your life. It's like the let's do lunch. You never do lunch. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know that one. I've had I've had a 15 year lunch plan with Sean William Scott. <laughs> We literally just texted about it again last week. It won't happen. It's been 15 years. It's never happening. We're never having lunch. So so I don't know if I was less like, I think I had tagged them in something because obviously I had covered them on my frat party album. 
I think that's how I connected with Taylor. I don't know. Neither one of us can remember. That's cool. We're just always together. Yeah. Well, it's one of those things where we don't know how we first connected, but we have a lot of mutual friends. So he's like, hey, let's get together and grab a drink. So we went to grab a drink, ended up hanging out at this bar right by my house till it closed. Then we sat in my truck for, you know, three hours. He played me the Lit album, Tastes Like Gold, like six months before it came out. We listened to it like front to back, stem to stern. Then he played me his other band that he's in with RJ Hale from Hailstorm. He's got a band called Chemical Fire that they have a new single dropping soon. They're so heavy and awesome. So yeah, Taylor's like, hey, we should write together. And I was like, great, that's a great idea. Two years later, two years later... <laughs> I kind of ink the deal with SBAM. I'm glad you said that. I was going to ask you how you pronounce that. I didn't know if it was a silent S or if it was... I thought it was spam, like spam, but spam. <laughs> right. And then I think I got corrected by Jarrett Reddick, who's the person who introduced me to SBAM. And so I inked the deal with SBAM and I was telling Taylor, oh, I'm doing this thing, working on a new record, trying to decide which of the three producers that I've worked with in the past I'm going to bring on to do this project. And he goes, I want to produce it. I said, oh, okay, well... I'll throw your name into the mix for sure. He goes, come into the studio. It was like a Friday. He's like, come into the studio on Monday and let's just see how it goes. We walked into the studio. Six hours later, we had the completed version of Tomorrow's Gonna Hurt. And I go, dude, the gig's yours. Like, I'd even call anybody else. I was just like, this is your job. You're producing this album. It's a great tune, though, mate. Thanks, man. Is that pretty representative of what you think the full album will be? I mean, it's definitely the album is going to be anthemic and hooks all over the place like that high energy though the follow-up song is the first time i've released a ballad since probably 2008 but it's still in that like pop punk blink 182 kind of like their title track one more time comes out december 1st but it still fits in line you know some of the tracks we're working on people are saying sound like early newfound glory but there's still a modern element too. I grew up with 90s grunge, you know, after the Wayne's World soundtrack, I started collecting, you know, things like my first five albums are, you know, Nirvana, Nevermind, Green Day, Dookie, Weezer, Blue Album. And then of course, like Blues Traveler, Hook and Spin Doctors. Solid start right there. <laughs> yeah, and I'm actually just looking at, I'm thinking about this list and I'm like, oh, well, snap. I've gotten close to like working almost with all of those people, not Green Day yet. Obviously recorded the Frat Party album at Dave Grohl's studio. Still haven't met Dave. And then nothing with Weezer yet. But I did do a tour with Chris Barron from Spin Doctors. And I was on a Blues Traveler album in 2015. But yeah, so I digress. I'm like tangenting myself. I'm tangenting the tangent of the tangent. So I grew up in that 90s. So everything I wrote, I think all of my previous releases always has an air of like 90s grunge. And there's a bit of a growl to my voice that I kind of have a tendency to work toward. Taylor, I think, is kind of like picking me up with like a, I don't even know, like one of those claw hands in the in the toy machine and just like going, cool, you're good, but let's just like bring you to 2023 <laughs> and drop you here. And then you get songs like Tomorrow's Gonna Hurt. You previously worked with Jarrett Reddick of Bowling for Soup and his production partner, Linus Dotson, on your reworking of BFS's 1985. Was that fun to have that song come alive in the studio? Is it all kind of, I think it kind of grew from a very organic place after you and Jarrett first met. We had done a podcast together. He doesn't do it anymore, but he did it like, I, I mean, I don't even know how many episodes. I think he watched every movie ever made it's called Jarrett Goes to the Movies. So we watched American Pie with a live audience, would pause and talk about the movie for the podcast recording. After that, we played like a duo acoustic show and we had just watched American Pie. And, you know, Jarek played the chorus of 1985, got through the first chorus. And as he's like jamming, he goes, you know, in classic Jared fashion, we should sing lyrics about American Pie. You know, that just popped into his head whilst he was doing it. Right. And that's all he <laughs> meant by it. it was a bit. We tried. We failed miserably. It was funny. We moved on. Well, at least he moved on. I held on to that thought. <laughs> and like the next day I woke up and I was like, that's a genius idea. Because I'd already done, you know, Stacy's mom into Stifler's mom. Right. Okay. And I only changed like one or two words, like maybe three words in total in that song. So it wasn't a true parody. It just was like a twist. 
It was like a lemon zest. But I was like, if I redo all the lyrics about American Pie, it would be a full on parody. Proper Weird Al territory. Yes, exactly. But here's the difference, right? So I texted him the lyrics. He said there'd be a funny TikTok. The TikTok got half a million views. He goes, come to the studio. I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but no one has corrected me yet. So I'm laying claim to this until someone proves otherwise. Weird Al has done a lot of parodies, but has he ever done a parody of a band and recorded it and written the parody with the band he was doing the parody of? Because that's what I did. <laughs> I'm sure he's probably done a live version, like got somebody on stage with him. But the recording thing, yeah, that'd be interesting. You might be a first there. Right, but he re-records the music. My version has Bowling for Soup behind me and Jared singing backups. <laughs> and we wrote the words together. So, yeah. Was that the first time you and Jared had connected through the podcast or had you been in contact before then? We had been told by mutual friends how much we would get along if we had ever met. So that came together. The first time of us hanging out in person was for that podcast. Prior to that, apparently in Nottingham, we both were there at that festival when I met Ace. He was with people on vacation at the time. I used to play bass for people on vacation. No way. Okay, so you were there. So you know what I'm talking. You played that festival then. Yeah, I played all the UK shows for them. Amazing. <laughs> it's a small world. World gets smaller. Yeah, so we had been told and only found out like this year that we were both at that festival together. Right, nuts. We've been told for years like we would get along. Jared and I call each other oil and oil. Or at least that's what Jared's wife calls us. We're kind of like too much fun together. I mean, he's, he's a very infectious personality and a truly loving person to be around. And which of a fan were you of the band prior to that, though? I was a fan, but I, I would say like now I've deep dove in. I obviously was familiar with the hits, of course. I was very confused that they never had a song on the soundtrack of American Pie because yeah. they clearly should have. And if we ever do American Pie 5, I'm like going to put it in my contract that there must be a Bowling for Soup song included in the soundtrack. Because Jared is just, he's literally, there's no one like him. He's the nicest person and he says yes and helps all of his friends. And I owe a lot to what's kind of happening and blossoming in my music career right now to Jared. He knows that. I was just with him at when we were young fest singing his praises and saying thank you. He was like, oh man, come on. Like I say, he's super supportive of your music. He brought you to the UK where you'd already performed for many years. But it's always awesome to be connected to anything Bowling for Soup related because their fan base is so receptive. Yeah. But you recently got to bring him into your world as narrator on your new show, Underdeveloped. Could you tell us a little bit about that? By the way, it should be coming to the UK soon. All of my friends in the UK have been like, when is it starting? Because it's on Tubi, which you don't have there, and Amazon Freemium Prime. There was apparently something wrong with the German subtitles. I'm like, guys, it's the UK. They don't speak German. I'm sure some people speak German, but can we just not get it there? So it should be coming soon. I apologize for the delay. Not that it's my fault. But yeah, I figured since Jarrett had opened up so many doors for me, I was actually, I was on the tour with Jarrett and Bowling for Soup. We were playing the makeup show in Torquay and I walked outside like 20 minutes before my set to negotiate with Tom Arnold's manager to lock Tom Arnold into the show. He said, yes, I walked inside. I was like jumping up and down. And then I just go, hey, Jared, we're going to do a press release. I go, do you want to be the narrator of the show? And he goes, yeah, man. And then that was it. And then I went and played my set. <laughs> the show focuses on a team of like failed and inexperienced film producers who are forced to work together. You yourself, you're an executive producer on the show. Yeah, another hat you wear alongside music and acting. How did you originally get into the production side of things? Oh, yeah, I totally forgot to answer your question about what the show is about. And I should say it's a mockumentary similar to The Office. And when I say The Office, I do mean both versions, the original Ricky Gervais UK version, which is my favorite, and the American reboot with Steve Carell. But we deal in the production side. You don't have to understand how films are made to understand the workplace comedy. It's more about the characters being inept and dealing with things that are unfortunately in our real life you know, like favoritism, inequality of pay, nepotism, racism, but we just make fun of it all. I have been producing films behind the camera since 2002 
was my first feature that I wrote, directed, produced, and starred in. Like in your early 20s, you were producing? Yeah. Little baby at 20. I'm 50 next year, so anyone like in early 20s, like little baby. I was a little baby. Well, I mean, I pretty much was at that point in my life where, you know, things were going great with the American Pie films, but like there was a difference of taking a bit of control. It kind of all stemmed from, I was trying to get a song on the soundtrack of all the movies. And even though, yeah, I've done six albums and this is my seventh, it's really my 10th. We just don't count the first three because every time I made one of those, the opportunity was there. I finished my first album, did the first American Pie. They said yes to having a song on the soundtrack. They didn't do it. And then like everything went south with that record. We had gotten Tower Records to like order 3,000 copies. And then distribution company went out of business. Oh, man. All sent back to me. I stored them for like 10 years. And now I finally just destroyed them. Got to get rid of these. Got to get rid of that memory. Yeah. But there was an element of like doing this DIY band stuff and then independent filmmaking where it was getting to be in control, getting to call the shots, not just taking direction and following the script and doing what you're told, but being the person behind it all. That's some pretty forward thinking for back then because that's what everything's about these days. Right. Well, I knew where everything was going. I mean, I remember having conversations with, you know, some of my close friends and sort of, you know, peers in that creative mindset in 2000 too, like, oh, everything's going to be moving towards a subscription basis. I couldn't have told you how it was going to happen, you know, as far as like having like $100 a hundred dollars a month for direct TV and you have all the channels versus now it's a hundred dollars a month, but it's five dollars to Apple, ten dollars to Netflix. Yeah. It's everyone's got their own sub. But I knew that was coming. There was like I understood where the evolution was going to go. But again, I didn't know how it was going to going to go because I was like, well, how would that work? Why would you have subscriptions to different companies when you could just get them all in a package? And I'm like, oh, that's how. You've been in the industry from like an incredibly young age. Are you originally from Las Vegas? Is that where you were raised or did you move out to California pretty young? I moved out to California pretty young. I was born in Vegas. Right. Technically, I lived on the outskirts of Vegas, about 30 miles outside of Vegas in a small town called Pahrump. I spent the first two years of life. Not that I have any memory. I have pictures. So, you know, picture it happened. And uh, and we moved to Northern California. My mom grew up in San Jose. So we lived in San Jose and Santa Cruz. Yeah, I came to LA when I was about six years old. I've been here ever since. Even though like a child actor, I think it was you who took your mom into letting you go into the industry rather than your family pushing you into films. Where did that interest come from, do you think? Was you always a lover of films and TV? Was there anything in particular that had a big impact on you? It was kind of what my mom was doing I wasn't trying to like take from her but she came to pursue her acting career and she was a you know a grown up being a dancer and an acrobat and things she came to pursue when she was 19 and then we came back again when I was 6 so she was pursuing her acting career. She got a job casting atmosphere and background. Now we would call them indie movies, but back then they were B movies. And so there was a movie she was casting with Lance Hendrickson. She got a call. It was like 10 p.m. on a Sunday. We need an altar boy shooting tomorrow at the graveyard, 6 a.m. call. And so she woke me up at like 5 a.m. She's like, hey, you're skipping school today and you're coming to work with me. And I was the altar boy. And that was like my first experience. I just loved it. I loved being on set. I loved skipping school. I, I loved, you know, the whole process. So that's where I got my first taste. And so I kept saying to my mom, like, hey, mom, let's do it again. What are you working on? Can I come with you again? So she brought me on to another set to do something. And from there, I was still like just goading her. Do you know the actor Scott Grimes? I know the name. His mom was an agent. So he helped me get my first agent. My mom was like working with him on a film. She was either casting Atmosphere or she was his stand-in or something. I don't know what was going on, but I just know he helped me get my first agent. And I started auditioning and I, you know, auditioning sucked. Finding the work sucked. But when you got the work, it was awesome. Your early TV roles read like some of my all-time favorite shows you played a young tony danzer in who's the boss in the late 80s but then worked on two more iconic shows baywatch and married with children any memories or stories come to mind from those shows maybe relating to pamela anderson or christine applegate <laughs> well so there's kind of like a cool thing at least with who's the boss and married with children they were kind of special episodes who's the boss one was the hundredth episode and tony played his own grandfather so i played young tony at the age of six 
And he got in like three hours of latex makeup and played his own grandfather for this flashback scene. For Married with Children, it was the Christmas special with Sam Kinison. Wow. Yeah, like Sam Kinison's like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> you know, he was the ghost of, you know, Christmas past or whatever it was. Was he terrifying on set? <laughs> <laughs> no, he was fun. He was fun. I mean, I was just a kid, you know, just having a great time. And then for Baywatch, I was part of the first season sort of cast. Okay. So like it was David Hasselhoff and Parker Stevenson. Erica Eleniak. Uh, why do I know all these hot people from Baywatch? <laughs> So yeah, I wasn't on the show with uh, with Pamela Anderson, although I was probably visiting because I became friends with the producer's kids who were around my age. So like I would go back and visit, even though I lost that on the job of Hobie. Right. My friend Jeremy got it, but I would just go and visit him on set and like hang out at the beach. Love it. Love it, man. And like you mentioned it earlier, your big movie break uh, role was in Rookie of the Year in 1993. The cast list is like Hollywood ate his royalty, John Candy, Gary Busey and uh, Daniel Stern in there. Was that intimidating at all with you being in such a large production or was you just super excited to be in that environment? I mean, I was super excited at that point. My second agent required me to like go to acting classes. So I'd been solidly going to acting classes for about six years. So I was, I wouldn't say like well-versed, but I had worked at the technique of it. I'd spent the time developing my technique as an actor and I probably was more mature at 12 than I am now. So I was <laughs> always considered to be an old soul. Okay. Plus Danny Stern was directing and he just was the sweetest guy. So under his helm, I felt very comfortable and it was just a good time. Even meeting him, I was enamored to meet him like for my first, but there's also like a crazy thing. Like you want to talk about if 80% of success is just showing up, I had a 160% chance of booking that movie. Reason being is the first time I auditioned, I did not get a call back. I was switching agents to my like then like third agent, got a call to go into audition. And I go, oh, I already went on that. And the new agent was like, well, they obviously don't remember you. So go again. <laughs> Point being is don't give up just because you didn't get picked. Go again. Yeah. Try again. Love it. How was it for you being like this fresh faced teenager seeing a film at the cinema that you're in? Do you remember the release at all or the premiere? I mean, the only thing I really remember about the premiere is we had this like funny idea. So I'm my mom's only, but I'm the youngest of seven. I've got a lot of half siblings and they're all like five years older and then and beyond. So we did this like really dumb thing, but it, it seemed funny at the time. I wore like a pair of jeans, kind of like Henry did in the film with his baseball uniform and like a tux top. Okay. And then I, all my brothers have like earpieces, had wires running down, like they were like secret service. So when the limo rolled up, they all like piled out and followed me around like they were like my secret sir. I don't know why we thought that was funny. I don't think anyone noticed it. There's no picture proof that this happened, but that is my memory of the premiere. That and like meeting Billy Crystal. Oh, nice. Where was it at? It was in Century City at the like Century City Mall where they have like a movie theater and there's a little roundabout where you can pull up right there. But it was wild. They had like a fast pitch or like a baseball pitch bullpen where people were like throwing baseballs and seeing how fast they could throw and there was like kids there from little league i don't know it's kind of a whirlwind time period as the 90s moved on i guess music was becoming more and more important to you i think you also saw your first gig in 1995 too the offspring at the whiskey a go-go i did yeah can you take us back to that night you are well versed rob i love it yeah i just actually when i was out when we were young in vegas the first night i went to the charity bomb event that Jarrett was playing at with Bowling for Soup and Tom Higginson. I actually was late because my son's birthday was that day. So he was turning 12 and he wanted to go have dinner. And I was like, well, I'm not playing. So I can't like ditch out on my son's like 12th <laughs> birthday dinner to go see all my friends. Just hang out. Yeah. So I'm going to go late. So I went late. But as I walk into the green room and see like some of the Bowling for Soup crew in walks noodles from the offspring. And so I'm standing with like Gavin, photographer for Bowling for Soup. And I'm like, that's Noodles standing right there. I should probably like go say what's up, but I don't want to bug him. He goes, man, you only live once. Go say what's up. I'm like, yeah, you're right. So I like went up to Noodles. and I was like, dude, I don't want to bug you. I just want to tell you, you were my first concert that I ever went to. 1995, K-Rock presented you guys at the Whiskey. I was 15. I went with my mom. I was in the mosh pit. 
mind blown. Yeah, like a dude with like an orange mohawk was, is that your mom? My mom was like looking scared like, oh, what's going to happen? He's like, I'll protect you. And he beat the crap out of anyone that got within like two feet of my mom, throwing people into the speaker stacks. Like if I fell down in the mosh pit, like this dude, was like my protector and picked me up. I still have the signed t-shirt from the offspring signed by Noodles. I back cataloged them at that point. I was such a huge Offspring fan. I went straight into Ignition from there, from Smash into Ignition. And just like, yeah, I was a 16-year-old full-on punk. I say this, you're laughing. No, I'm just all in. I love it. I did my hair like Dexter had his hair like that year. I was like, I was all in. How long was your hair though to do that? Oh no, I got extensions. All right. There's a picture of me somewhere. I can't find it now. My mom had bought me my second guitar, which I still have. It's my Les Paul Honey Burst. And I'm like standing in front of the mirror, like looking cool. And it's right before the guitar like fell and like broke one of the tuning pegs. And I was like, ah, locking straps are the way to go. (laughs) Yes. Definitely. Being so into music and living in a city where there are lots of opportunities and contacts in the music industry as well. You was doing the acting as well. Was it at all conflicting doing the acting, but also being incredibly passionate about being a musician as well? Man, I almost didn't get American Pie because of how much I loved playing music. Right. So I had my band. Well, I started really playing at church at first every Sunday and I would like get to throw in an original song during the offering. That was kind of like my gig because it was this thing where I'm sight reading and, you know, playing along every week, you know, having rehearsals and this consistent sort of thing. So I started my first band. So this is probably, yeah, it was probably around... 96. My best friend from junior high school, I begged him to play bass on it. He did. He like learned how to play bass just to be in my band. I was like, you have to be in the band. And so we were just gigging around town, just drivable stuff. And I remember I would get auditions and I'd be like, oh, I can't make that. I got band rehearsal. So I'd be like moving them all the time. It was pissing my agent off. You went to play to 10 people and you missed this like multi-million dollar audition. Absolutely. Absolutely, I was. I was doing open mic nights and anything I could do. But I remember I got a gig that was like semi-decent and I had an audition and it conflicted. And I called to like cancel my audition or move my audition and they couldn't see me. I was like, well, forget it then. I got this gig. I'm out. I remember my agent told his assistant, who I was really good friends with the assistant, told his assistant, like, get him on the phone. I'm letting him go. And so she pretended to like try to get me on the phone and like did it and basically did that dance for like two weeks. Just couldn't get me on the line for him to let me go as a client. And right around that time, the audition for American Pie was like coming through. And I remember I got the audition and then I read the script. Now remember, I'm also still playing at church. So I open up this thing and I'm like opening scenes like, you know, Kevin's getting instructions from Vicky on like how to move his fingers And like the title of it's like untitled teen sex comedy, you know, that you can make for under $10 million that studios will hate, but audiences will love. And I'm like, I read the first page and I'm like, smut. Had you seen Porkies at this point? (laughs) No, I don't think I'd even seen. I'd seen Animal House, but that's fairly like, you know, tame in comparison to Porkies. So this time, like my agent's assistant calls and says, hey, they really want to see you for this. Meanwhile, I don't know that she's being told to like get me on the phone to like let me go. So she's like hiding me in the roster. And so I say, okay, I'll I'll read the script all the way through. I, of course, didn't go get it because this is back in the day. No one could email you a script. This is, you know, 98. No one could fax it to you either. That'd be like more than a roll of fax paper. And so I said, listen, I didn't come and get it or I didn't read it. So I'll go on the audition tomorrow, leave it in the Dropbox. I had to drive to Century City to pick it up late at night. I think my high school girlfriend's parents were out of town. Like I was staying at their place. I woke up at like five in the morning. I'm like reading it at my girlfriend's place, laughing my ass off. I'm going, oh, this is amazing. I have to go on this. And so, yeah, music almost cost it, though. There you go. Might have been a whole different story. (laughs) But music also saved the job, though. I joke, it's not just save Ferris, it's save Kevin. So Andrew Keegan, who I went to high school with, had booked 10 Things I Hate About You. And he got the offer to play Kevin in American Pie. So they were trying to coordinate the two shoots so he could do both jobs. He signed 10 Things I Hate About You. They were trying to work out the schedule. There was one date that was a problem. And it was unmovable because that was the date that they were filming Save Ferris. Because of that date, Andrew couldn't do American Pie. 
which is why they called to say, hey, we really want to see Thomas because Andrew and I would compete all the time right. for the same jobs. We had a, a similar look. Was you like the Corey Heyman, Corey Feldman of the <laughs> late 90s? I wouldn't go that far, but yes, it was <laughs> somewhere in that realm. And then what's funny is that I tell this story to Monique at a gig in the UK a couple of years ago with my buddy Matt Stocks. And then Monique goes, oh, you know, it's really funny. We moved the date right before we were filmed it because our tour changed and we had to move the filming date. So I was like, well, that's the way it always goes. You're a regular at Comic Cons, both in the US and UK. What's most popular in the US? Is it American Pie or because of Rookie of the Year's cult status over there? Does that get a lot of interest from people? It was really American Pie. And obviously, then it started getting kind of even. And now, at least in the US and, you know, places where baseball is known, it's become Rookie of the Year. Right. Because it's older and nostalgia is just like, you know, running rampant right now. But I'll be honest, even when I was over there opening for Bowling for Soup, I brought like a few Roland Gartner Cubs jerseys with me and I sold out of them. And the Cubs did recently play an exhibition series in London. I think they did like nine games or something like that. So obviously you've got American football going over there and doing exhibition games and now American baseball. So, you know, I think we're kind of at a period of time right now where we're, we're going to sort of be just closing the gap. It's not going to be because of technology and because of, you know, everyone's watching the same feed on social. Yeah. Globalization is <laughs> is is in route. It's not going to be like going to a place where, I don't know, 10 years ago, in the UK, it'd be like no one had even heard of Rookie of the Year. Now, like they kind of have like a little idea. What about Halloween fans coming up after you being in Halloween Resurrection in 2002? Because I mean, that franchise is just grows and grows. Yeah, it's uh, it keeps growing, although I don't exist anymore, Rob. Well, yeah, depending what timeline you're in. Uh, yeah, I'm in an alternate <laughs> timeline. I'm, I'm over with Loki because, you know, Jamie Lee Curtis <laughs> died in my movie and now she's back alive. So it's like I never existed. But yeah, my buddy Sean Koss did this amazing artwork piece of my kill scene or my death scene in that with like Michael Myers stabbing me in the... I essentially become the pumpkin. (laughs) (laughs) And so yes, there's some renewed interest in that film. Yeah, for sure. Well, this is the completest. They got to get everybody. Right? How are you spending Halloween this year as a dad? You know, this is the first year that my son, now that he's turned 12, and even though, you know, he's following in my footsteps as an actor, like, I don't know if you saw that he was the main kid in M. Night's movie old yeah that's awesome yeah and he's tom arnold's son in underdeveloped which obviously you'll be able to see soon in the uk so you'd think considering that i still dress up for halloween but you know he's 12 going on 15 okay so he's like i don't want to dress up this year i don't know really what that does for our halloween plans he's got a birthday party to go to today where costumes are encouraged I want to just totally embarrass him and like dress up in a costume while he doesn't and show up at his friend's birthday party with him. I think that'd be funny. Do you have any Hollywood Halloween memories as a kid? Probably the funniest one is more recent. Like I think now maybe five, six years ago, I went to Seth Rogen's Hilarity for Charity event. And I remember I showed up there. I don't remember what costume I was wearing. I think I might've been like a Jedi or something, you know, something like boring. Not that Jedis are boring, but Back when I was a fan of Star Wars, it wasn't cool to be a fan of Star Wars. Now, Star Wars is on everything. Yeah. And so I got there, and as I arrived there and I saw them doing a red carpet, which I didn't realize there was going to be one. I just thought it was a charity event, and it was costume-themed because it was on Halloween night or whatever. I went, oh, man, the Cubs are facing the Dodgers in the playoffs right now. There's a red carpet. I go... I blew it. I should have worn a Roman Gardner jersey. Oh, and I saw Scott Eastwood was there and he was dressed as his dad from the good, the bad and the ugly, like full on poncho, the whole nine. Right. And I was like, man, I blew it. So I was like, wait a second. It's, you know, 2017. We got Uber. So I called home and I was like, can you grab my jersey, grab my hat, put it in a bag, ordered an Uber to my house. (laughs) And I said, you're not picking me up. You're picking up my costume and you're driving it to me. So I literally Uber ordered, not Uber Eats, but Uber costume. So I wore that on the red carpet for the charity event. And I recently had a Topps card come out a few weeks ago. No way. For their Allen and Ginter series. And that's the photo they chose is me on that red carpet. So I was like, it wouldn't have worked in a Jedi outfit. Brilliant stuff. Thomas, last question. I'm going to put you on the spot. But I think how we started off, I think I know the answer to one of them already. I want you to time travel to a Friday night 
maybe late 80s, early 90s, you head into the video store. What movie soundtrack do you have on the Walkman? And what three tapes are you going to rent for the weekend? Man. All right. Well, late 80s, in reality, I hadn't gotten my Walkman yet. But if I did have one, it would be Led Zeppelin Houses of the Holy, for sure. Because that's around the time that I was like jamming that. Because that was mainly in the car. My mom had like a cassette case with like... Five, 10, 15 cassettes in it. Right. Yeah. yeah. Under the passenger seat, <laughs> you know, hiding so no one would steal it. But that was like, I was the, you know, I was the radio DJ in the car rides. So yeah. So it would have been Led Zeppelin Houses of the Holy. This is pre Wayne's World soundtrack. Because I didn't get that one till like 91. Okay. Or 92. So this is, you know, late 80s. It's definitely Led Zeppelin. So there's another wild thing. So remember, I said I'm like the youngest of seven. So my dad's first wife's stepdad, a video store went out of business. And he bought all the cassette tapes. So in the living room of their house, oh there God. were 700 VHS <laughs> and they were all numbered. Yeah. So what you would do is if you were going there and you wanted to borrow something, you could borrow anything you wanted. You'd write down your name and the movie you were taking out. He had his own rental store in his front room. Yeah. And if Richie wanted to see the movie and he went to go get it and you had it, he'd call you and be like, bring my VHS back. <laughs> So what three tapes was I watching in the late 80s and late 80s? Man. Okay. So that was, I'm trying to think like I was around the time I was filming Radio Flyer. I think it would have been like Goonies and like maybe like RoboCop. Yes. RoboCop for like an eight to nine year old kid. One of the most violent films of all time. I know. Which had a cartoon series and toys. I know. Well, it was marketed to us. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. And then probably like never ending story. That's a night. That's a night in. Yeah. You've got gore. You've got emotion with a never ending story with the horse. You go through every level of emotion. You got fantasy, action, you know, violence, yeah. sadness, and then like adventure with Goonies. Yeah. Super. Great choices, mate. Great choices. <laughs> Love it. Thomas, I'll let you go, but I've loved chatting with you. That's been a blast. Rob, thank you so much for having me on, man. This has been like this hour just like flew by. That's what I like. Thank you so much for having me, man. Massive thank you to Thomas Nicholas for such a fun and upbeat talk here on the Straight to Video podcast. It's always cool to have someone on the show with loads of energy and fun stories, so I really enjoyed that one, and hopefully you did too. Be sure to check out tinicholas.com to find his upcoming tour dates and listen to the brand new single Tomorrow's Gonna Hurt, which I've loved spinning a bunch and I look forward to the new album when it's released. So after a few really busy months, what with the recent TCC reunion show, a bunch of stuff happening at the 80s video shop, and of course some Halloween fun, things seem to be quieting down a little, so I'd love to hear what you'd like to see and hear next from Straight to Video. We're making plans for some cool end of year stuff over at the video shop, and Chris and I have just released a short new series of What's in the Egg Rob over on our YouTube channel, so we'd love it if you checked out those. But please hit me up with anything particular you'd love to see or hear. I am all ears. For now, though, that's all for this episode, and I'll be back next Friday. So until then, always be kind, please rewind and unwind, and I'll speak to you all real soon. 